Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Sok Jun Kwan working at KIST and KIST School. I'm a principal research scientist holding an associate professor at UST, who is a main instructor of this course. Welcome to the lecture too. In this lecture, I will introduce nanomaterials. In Lecture 2, we focus on the nanomaterials. First, we will explore the concept and definition of nanomaterials. For your understanding, we will learn about a brief history of nanomaterials too. In addition, I will talk about little bit about the nanomaterials found in nature. Next, we will explore nanoparticles and carbon nanomaterials. In this part, I will talk about a variety of organic and inorganic nanoparticles. In addition, I will talk about in detail about the carbonaceous nanomaterials such as graphene, carbon nanotubes, nanodiamonds, fullerene, graphite, and so on. It is also important to know about how we can prepare the nanomaterials. In the third section, I will talk about synthetic routes to the nanomaterials. In the fourth section, you will be given a brief introduction to the surface engineering to form the nano-structured surfaces of materials. Finally, we will learn about a variety of applications contributed by nanomaterials. It is important to know about both the fundamental and applicative aspects of nanomaterials for your research irrespective of your research topics. Nanoscale materials are defined as a set of substances where at least one dimension is less than approximately 100 nanometers. A nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter, approximately 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. Nanomaterials are of interest because at this scale unique optical, magnetic, electrical, and other properties emerge. These emergent properties have the potential for great impacts in electronics, medicine, and other fields. Nanomaterials are cornerstones of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Nanostructure science and technology is a broad and interdisciplinary area of research and development activity that has been growing explosively worldwide in the past few years. It has the potential for revolutionizing the ways in which materials and products are created and the range and nature of functionalities that can be accessed. It is already having a significant commercial impact, which will assuredly increase in the future. The history of nanomaterials began immediately after the Big Bang when nanostructures were formed in the early meteorites. Fell in 1969 in Victoria, Australia, the Murchison meteorites have been studied intensively to find the condition of the outer space, outside of our solar system. Such as composition of materials, temperature, radiation level, and so on. One of the most interesting aspects of the Murchison meteorites is that it has very small diamonds. The diamonds are too small, and the size is less than 10 nanometers. Therefore, the many diamonds are called nanodiamonds. Actually, it can be synthesized in the lab using relevant chemical conditions such as high pressure and temperature, however, it is not easy to synthesize the nanodiamonds without the formation of out graphite. Therefore, it is very interesting to find the nearly pure nanodiamonds in meteorites. In other meteorites, it is not a rare event to find various kinds of nanocrystals such as magnetite, barium titanate, alumina, and other oxide nanocrystals. They can grow in larger scales such as microcrystals as shown in the lower left electron microscope images. Most of the crystals found in the meteorites are inorganic due to a fact that the space condition is harsh for organic particles. However, there are some organic molecules in the meteorites such as carbohydrates. 
nature later evolved many other nanostructures like seashells, skeletons etc. Nanoscaled smoke particles were formed during the use of fire by early humans. The scientific story of nanomaterials however began much later. As introduced in the first lecture, ancient Romans and Greeks employed metallic or inorganic nanomaterials to control colors of artifact and hair. It was 19th that scientists could successfully control the synthesis of regular-sized metallic nanoparticles. One of the first scientific report is the colloidal gold particles synthesized by Michael Faraday as early as 1857. Faraday spent a significant amount of time in the mid-1850s investigating the properties of light and matter. He made several hundred gold slides and examined them by shining light through them. To make the gold leaf thin enough to be transparent, however, Faraday had to use chemical means rather than mechanical. Commercial gold leaf was made by hammering the metal into very thin sheets but this was too thick for his purposes. Part of this process involved washing the films of gold, which Faraday noticed produced a faint ruby-colored fluid. He kept samples of the fluid in bottles and used them for similar experiments, shining a beam of light through the liquid. In his notebook Faraday observes, the cone was well defined in the fluid by the illuminated particles. He realized that this cone effect was made because the fluid contained suspended gold particles that were too small to see with the scientific apparatus of the time but which scattered the light to the side. This is known as the Faraday-Tyndall effect, and it is because of this discovery that Faraday is seen as one of the first researchers into nanoscience and nanotechnology. Interestingly, these colloids are still optically active. We can do exactly the same experiment as Faraday by shining a modern laser pointer through the bottle and producing a cone of light. Nobody knows why this is as we can't unseal the bottles without damaging them but it's very unusual, while most colloids last for a few months or even a year, Faraday's are now over 150 years old. Nanostructured catalysts have also been investigated for over 70 years. By the early 1940s, precipitated and fumed silica nanoparticles were being manufactured and sold in USA and Germany as substitutes for ultrafine carbon black for rubber reinforcements. As shown in the left figure, Silica nanoparticles can intervene the clustering of polymeric particles with a native water molecules. After drying, the mixture of silica nanoparticles and polymer form a strong and flexible materials. Nano-sized amorphous silica particles have found large-scale applications in many everyday consumer products, ranging from non-diary coffee creamer to automobile tires, optical fibers and Catalyst supports. In the 1960s and 1970s metallic nanopowders for magnetic recording tapes were developed. As shown in the lower right figure, nanoscale metallic nanoparticles can be used for the high frequency. Soft magnetic cores for electronic devices such as semiconductor based power transduction modules. For the cores. Magnetic phase core is surrounded by insulating shells. Then, they are transformed into the consolidated cores in which the core shell nanoparticles are assembled into the confined geometry. In 1976, for the first time, nanocrystals produced by the now popular inert gas evaporation technique was published by Grankvist and Blurman. Recently it has been found that the Maya blue paint is a nanostructured hybrid material. The origin of its color and its resistance to acids and biocorrosion are still not understood but studies of authentic samples from China Island show that the material is made of needle-shaped polygerskite which is clay crystals that form a superlattice with a period of 1.4 nanometers, 
with intercalates of amorphous silicate substrate containing inclusions of metal, mg, nanoparticles. The beautiful tone of the blue color is obtained only when both these nanoparticles and the superlattice are present, as has been shown by the fabrication of synthetic samples. In 1980s, carbonaceous nanomaterial such as buccally ball or fullerene was synthesized. Another big advance was made by Professor Bross at Columbia University. It was the synthesis of semiconductor quantum dots. In 1990s, there were another big advances in the preparation of carbonaceous nanomaterials such as single and multi-wall carbon nanotubes. In 2000s, two-dimensional carbonaceous nanomaterial, called as graphene, was prepared by Vigm and Novoselov. We will explore in detail for the carbonaceous materials later. Today nanophase engineering expands in a rapidly growing number of structural and functional materials, both inorganic and organic, allowing to manipulate mechanical, catalytic, electric, magnetic, optical and electronic functions. The production of nanophase or cluster assembled materials is usually based upon the creation of separated small clusters which then are fused into a bulk-like material or on their embedding into compact liquid or solid matrix materials. For example nanophase silicon, which differs from normal silicon in physical and electronic properties, could be applied to macroscopic semiconductor processes to create new devices. For instance, when ordinary glass is doped with quantized semiconductor colloids, it becomes a high performance optical medium with potential applications in optical computing. Nanomaterials are frequently found in nature. From insects to animal, nanomaterials have been the optimized strategy for the survival and evolution of many lives on Earth. For example, let's look at the lotus leaf. This leaf is well known to repel the water droplet on its surface. This is due mainly to the fact that the leaf has a surface with chemically and physically optimized structure. First of all, the leaf has hydrophobic surface, which means the chemical compound composing the surface has high enthalpic interaction with the water molecules. This makes the interface energy between the water molecules and the leaf surface high and therefore, the water molecules select the way of minimizing free energy of the droplet, which is the increase in the contact angle of the droplet at the leaf surface. Second, the leaf looks like the nanoengineering surface. For example, as shown in the second and third rows in this figure, you can find some hierarchical structures of the leaf, which makes the leaf have large surface areas and protruded parts. These structures work as Casey-Baxter structure, which increase the surface energy of the structured leaf. Therefore, the water droplet suffers higher interface energy than that for the non-structured flat leaf. The combination of the chemically and physically optimized structures of the lotus leaf turns the leaf into the naturally water-repellent materials. We will explore in detail in next slide on this. Another interesting example of nanomaterials or nanostructures in nature is hierarchical structures observed in butterfly wing. For example, the wing of Morpho butterfly is composed of microscale scales, which is composed of nanostructured periodic grating like structures. These nanostructures work as nano grating, which can interfere with the visible light from the sun and makes the absorption or reflection of light at specific wavelength to enhance desired colors. These colors are independent of the color pigments and resulting from structural design of the nanoscale materials. Therefore, these colors are called structural colors. For the structural colors, we will explore in detail in Lecture 4. In the third column, we can find moth-eye-like structure of microlens. As shown in the second and third rows, 
the assembly of microscale lens is composed of nanostructured surface. These nanostructured mock eye structure works to collect and combine visible light from the sun. They can be optimized to collect broadband solar spectrum. It has given a good hint for the scientists and engineers to design the high efficiency photovoltaic cells and detect such as solar cells. What about the gecko's toe? We have already met the gecko in the first lecture. As shown in the second and third column, we can find somewhat interesting nanostructure for the gecko's toe. The nanostructures contribute to the high stickiness of the toe by increasing the surface area and increasing the interface energy between the surface and the toe. In plant, we can also find the natural nanomaterials. For example, in rose petal, you can see the nanostructures. In particular, the rose petal has pyramid-like nanostructures. It is known that the pyramid-like nanostructure are advantageous to repel the moisture and absorb the solar spectrum. We can keep exploring the natural nanostructures found in plant. For example, in Nepenthe's leaf, there exist cylinder-like nanostructures. These structures are advantageous in forming flexible and mechanically strong tissue to contain insects inside the pocket of the leaf. Actually, Nanostructured materials are advantageous for seashells to form mechanically tough materials. Most of the seashells have strong shells, by which inner soft tissues are nearly completely protected from outer environment. For the seashells, the shells are composed of multi-layered nanoplatelets as shown in the right figure. The layered nanoplatelets are advantageous in diminishing the propagation of mechanical impact when the impact is applied normal to the layers. Inspired by these multi-layered seashells, scientists and engineers synthesized mechanically strong and lightweight bulletproof vest and armors. Before getting deep into the world of nanomaterials, let us explore in detail the nanostructures of a lotus leaf. As explained in the previous slide, the importance of a lotus leaf's nanoscale hair-like structure on its self-cleaning ability. Researchers have reported the influence of micro and nanoscale structures on the wetting behavior of lotus leaves. When rain falls on lotus leaves water beads up with a high contact angle. The water drops promptly roll off the leaves, collecting dirt along the way. This self-cleaning ability or lotus effect has, in recent years, stimulated much research effort worldwide for a variety of applications ranging from self-cleaning window glasses, paints, and fabrics to low friction surfaces. The lotus leaf's ability to shed water is due to its multi-leveled roughness. The combination of the microscale mounds and the nanoscale hair-like structures causes falling water to bead up and roll off the leaf. By altering the surface structure of the leaves while keeping their chemical composition approximately the same the researchers were able to confirm the importance of the lotus leaf's nanoscale hair-like structure on its self-cleaning ability. Researchers did this by heating the leaf until the nanoscale hair-like structures melted, at 150 degrees of Celsius, coating the leaf surface. This heating process, while keeping the chemical composition of the surface approximately the same, alters the roughness such that the contact angle is decreased and water droplets no longer roll off the leaf. Besides helping design self-cleaning surfaces the findings of this work may also improve the understanding of wetting mechanisms. As explained in the previous slide, most of the nanomaterials observed in nature have specific function, which help the lives to live, survive, mate, and reproduce. In particular, the nanostructured materials can give profound functionality such as optical or photonic performances. For example, Morpho butterfly can obtain its blue wing color from nanostructured wings not from the blue pigments. For the wing, 
there exists nanostructured grating and photonic crystal which can absorb and destructively interfere with solar spectrum except some specific band, in which specific range of wavelength of solar spectrum is allowed to reflect. For the Morifo butterfly, the strongest reflectivity is at the blue band, and therefore, its wing looks like blue from any viewing angle. This makes the Morifo butterfly wing have iridescence. The optically working nanostructures observed in nature are mostly photonic crystals. Similar to semiconductor crystals, the photonic crystals are the materials in which materials with different refractive indices are interwoven with specific symmetries and periodicities. For your reference, the semiconductor crystals have periodic and symmetric structures with different electron densities. And therefore, the crystals have designated electronic structures, by which the crystal have conduction and valence spans. For some energies, there exists gap between the two bands, and the gap works like to be insulating materials for the charge career conduction. If the gap can be controlled by the doping or external field, it works as semiconductor. Similar to the semiconductor crystals, Photonic crystals can form some photonic bands, and with relevant periodicities and symmetries, the crystals can have photonic band gap, in which electromagnetic wave with specific wavelength is not allowed to penetrate the crystals. One of the mostly well-known photonic crystals found in nature would be opals, shown in the middle in this figure. Actually, the natural opal is an assembled structure with different photonic crystals with different photonic band gap, which makes different reflections, resulting in different colors. Natural photonic crystals can be found in birds' features such as peacock's features. Another example of the natural photonic crystal is an exoskeleton of insects such as the back shell of beetles.